On the evening of April the 14th, 1912, the Royal Mail steamer Titanic, heralded as the greatest ship in the world, struck an iceberg in the North Atlantic and founded in little more than two hours. There were 2,203 souls on board. Only 706 of them would see the light of the following day. In an attempt to understand what had happened, the American and British governments held a series of hearings into the disaster. The hearings were filled with eyewitness accounts that detailed every minute of that terrifying night, and they came from several very different points of view. It was the gripping testimony of these witnesses that would become the basis for many of the subsequent books and films on the sinking of the Titanic. The American hearings were open to the public, and they were held in the Waldorf Astoria in New York City. The elegant furniture was removed from the East Room of the hotel and replaced with conference tables and straight-back chairs. At nine o'clock on the morning of Friday the 19th of April, just five days after the great ship had sunk, the doors were opened and within ten minutes the room was filled to capacity. The hearings were chaired by Senator William Alden Smith of Michigan, a small man with a booming voice. The political maverick, Senator Smith had a reputation as a great orator. A political rival once said that he could wring tears and force cheers from a grindstone. Senator Smith's mission was simple, to find out what had gone wrong, to discover the truth. In this endeavor, he would question 82 people, they were two general officers from International Mercantile Marine, the company that owned the Titanic, the four surviving ship's officers, 34 members of the crew, 23 experts, and 21 passengers who came from each of the classes aboard the ship. What you are about to see are highlights from those hearings conducted by Senator Smith. This actual testimony is the closest thing there is to the truth. The truth as to why the RMS Titanic now lies on the bottom of the North Atlantic. The most anticipated witness was J. Bruce Ismay, managing director of the White Star Line, and himself a first-class passenger aboard the ship. Ismay's father co-founded the White Star Line in the late 1800s, and later on, when the company was sold to J.P. upon Morgan in 1900, an agreement was reached whereby Ismay would continue on as managing director and chairman. Before he testified at the hearing, Ismay had been vilified by the international press as a coward for having saved himself while hundreds of women and children went to a watery grave. I will ask you a few preliminary questions. First state your full name, please. Joseph Bruce Ismay. And your place of residence? Liverpool. And your age? I shall be 50 on the 12th of December. And your occupation? Ship owner. Will you kindly tell the committee the circumstances surrounding your voyage, together with any circumstances you feel would be helpful to us in this inquiry? In the first place, I would like to express my sincere grief at this deplorable catastrophe. I understand that you gentlemen have been appointed by the Senate to inquire into the circumstances. So far as we are concerned, we welcome it. We court the fullest inquiry. We have nothing to conceal, nothing to hide. The ship was built in Belfast. She was the latest thing in the art of shipbuilding. Absolutely no money was spared in her construction. She was not built by contract. She was simply built on a commission. She underwent her trials, which were entirely satisfactory. The accident took place on Sunday night. What the exact time was, I do not know. I was in bed myself, asleep, when the accident happened. The ship sank, I'm told, at 2.20. I understand that it has been stated that the ship was going at full speed. The ship never had been at full speed. The full speed of the ship is 78 revolutions. She works up to 80. So far as I'm aware, she never exceeded 75 revolutions. Will you describe what you did after the impact or collision? I presume the impact awakened me. I then went back into my room, put on my coat, and went up to the bridge, where I found Captain Smith. I asked him what had happened, and he said, we have struck ice. I said, do you think the ship is seriously damaged? 
He said, I'm afraid she is. I heard the order to get the boat out. I stood upon the deck practically until I left the ship in the starboard collapsible boat, which is the last boat to leave the ship, so far as I know. More than that, I do not know. You say that the trip was a voluntary trip on your part. Absolutely. For the purpose of viewing this ship in action, or did you have some business in New York? I had no business to bring me to New York at all. I simply came in the natural course of events, as one is apt to in the case of a new ship, to see how she works, and with the idea of seeing how we could improve on her for the next ship which we were building. Did you have the occasion to consult with the captain about the movements of the ship? Never. Did he consult you about it? Never. Perhaps I'm wrong in saying that. I should like to say this. I do not know that it was quite a matter of consulting him about it or of his consulting me about it, but what we had arranged to do was that we would not attempt to arrive in New York at the lightship before five o'clock on Wednesday morning. How did it happen that the women were first put aboard these lifeboats? The natural order would be women and children first. That was followed? As far as practical. And were all the women and children accommodated in these lifeboats? I could not tell you, sir. How many passengers were in the lifeboat in which you left the ship? I should think about 45. Was that its full capacity? Practically. Was there any struggle or jostling or any attempts by men to get into the boats? I saw none. Were children shown the same consideration as the women? Absolutely. How long were you on the ship after the collision occurred? I think it was an hour and a quarter. What were the circumstances of your departure from the ship? The boat was there, there was a certain number of men in the boat, and the officer called out asking if there were any more women, and there was no response. And there were no passengers left on the deck. There were no passengers on the deck? No, sir, and as the boat was in the act of being lowered away, I got into it. Mr. Ismay, what can you say about the sinking and disappearance of the ship? Can you describe the manner in which she went down? I did not see her go down. How far were you from the ship? I do not know how far we were away. I was sitting with my back to the ship. I was rowing all the time I was in the boat. We were pulling away. Did you not care to see her go down? No, and I'm glad I did not. Do you know whether the ship was equipped with a full complement of lifeboats? If she had not been, sir, she could not have sailed. She would not have received a passenger certificate, and therefore she must have been fully equipped. Do you know what water capacity there was on the ship? I mean, when she stove in, how many compartments could be flooded with safety? The ship was specially constructed so that she would float with any two compartments full of water. When we built the Titanic, we had that especially in mind. If this ship had hit the iceberg stem on, in all human probability, she would have been here today. Had the Titanic carried double the number of lifeboats, or treble the number of lifeboats, do you consider that there might have been an increase in the number of passengers and crew saved? I think that is quite possible, sir. The next to testify was Arthur Henry Rostron, the captain of the Carpathia. The Carpathia was the only ship to arrive in time to save drifting survivors. Captain Rostron would later be hailed as a true hero. Please give your full name and address. Arthur Henry Roston, Woodville, Victoria Road, Crosby, Liverpool. You are now captain of the Carpathia? I am now the captain of the Carpathia Cunard Line. How long have you been captain of the Carpathia? My appointment on the Carpathia dates from the 18th of January of this year. What day did you sail with the Carpathia from New York last? The 11th of April. I wish you would tell the committee what occurred after that day, as nearly as you can, up to the present time? We backed out from the dock at noon on Thursday. From that time up to Sunday midnight, we had fine, clear weather, and everything was going on without any trouble of any kind. At 12.35 a.m. on Monday, I was informed of the urgent distress signal from the Titanic. By whom? By our wireless operator, and also by the first officer. The position of the Titanic at the time was 41 degrees 46 north, 50 degrees 14 west. 
I should judge from what you say that you made 19 and a half knots from the time you got the signal of distress from the Titanic until you reached the scene of the wreck or loss. No, it was 58 miles and it took us three and a half hours. At 4.10, I got the first boat alongside. You are picking up these people now? Yes. Please describe that in your own way. By the time we had the first boat's people, it was breaking day, and then I could see the remaining boats all around within an area of about four miles. I also saw icebergs all around me. We got all the boats alongside and all the people up aboard by 8.30. I was very close to where the Titanic must have gone down, as there was a lot of, uh, uh, hardly wreckage, but small pieces of broken up stuff, nothing in the way of anything large. At eight o'clock, the Leyland Line steamer California hove up, and we exchanged messages. I, I want to go back again a little bit. At 8.30, I asked for the purser and told him that I wanted to hold a service. A short prayer of thankfulness for those rescued, and a short burial service for those who were lost. I consulted Mr. Ismay. I ran down for a moment and told them that I wished to do this, and Mr. Ismay left everything in my hands. I then got an Episcopal clergyman, one of our passengers, and asked him if he would do this for me, which he did willingly. And while they were holding the service, I was on the bridge, of course, and I maneuvered around the scene of the wreckage, and we saw nothing except one body. Floating? Floating, sir. Have you concluded that you did not see the ill-fated ship at all? Oh, no. We arrived an hour and a half after she went down, after the last of her was seen. What was the last message you had from the ship? Engine room nearly full. Did you personally know the captain of the Titanic? I knew him, yes. How long have you known him? I had met him 15 years ago. I had only met him three times altogether. In your company, who is the master of the ship at sea? The captain. In absolute control? In absolute control, legal and otherwise. No one can interfere. I suppose, had this not been so, you would not have felt it proper to have gone off course quite so far. Quite so. Are there prescribed routes at sea that are so definite in their character as to be well understood by mariners? They are. I may state this, that the position given to me by the Titanic was absolutely correct, and she was absolutely on her track, bound for New York. What would you call the course, Captain, that the Titanic was taking for New York, as to whether it would be northerly or southerly? He was on the southerly route. Do you regard the route he was taking as entirely practical and appropriate at this time of the year? Quite so. This is most exceptional. Is not that the shortest route from Liverpool to New York? No, it is the longest. You say, Captain, that you ran under a full head of steam toward the Titanic. I can confess this much, that if I had known at the time that there was so much ice about, I should not. But I was right in it then. There was one other consideration. Although I was running a risk with my own ship and my own passengers, I also had to consider what I was going for. To save the lives of others? Yes, I had to consider the lives of others. You were prompted by your interest in humanity? Absolutely. And you took the chance? It was hardly a chance. Uh, of course it was a chance, but at the same time I knew quite what I was doing. I considered that I was perfectly free and that I was perfectly right in what I did. I suppose no criticism has been passed upon you? No. In fact, I think I may say for my associates that your conduct deserves the highest praise. I thank you, sir. A key witness during the early stage of the hearings was Harold S. Bride. Bride was the only surviving Marconi operator from the Titanic. Marconi himself, the Italian electrical engineer and pioneer of the wireless telegraph, would later be called to testify as one of the 
expert witnesses. What is your full name? Harold S. Bride. Where do you reside? London. What is your age? 22. What is your occupation? Wireless telegraph operator, sir. Who is your chief? Mr. Phillips. Were you on duty when the wireless message was received from the America regarding the proximity of icebergs in that longitude? I have no knowledge of a wireless message received from the America regarding any iceberg. There may have been one received by Mr. Phillips, but I did not see one myself. Did you ever talk to the captain regarding such a message? There was a message delivered to the captain in the afternoon, sir, late in the afternoon, regarding the ice field. From whom? From the California, sir. I received that message and delivered it to the captain. It stated that there were three icebergs that the ship had just passed, and it gave their position. Were you in bed when the collision occurred? Yes, sir. Were you awakened? No, sir. How were you awakened? I woke up on my own accord. This was after the collision? After the collision. What did the captain say? He told us that we'd better get assistance. Was the message sent out immediately? Yes. Please state it. CQD, about half a dozen times. MGY, half a dozen times. Will you kindly explain the meaning of these letters or code? CQD is a recognized distress call. Uh, MGY is the co-call of the Titanic. How long after that call was sent out was it before you got a reply? As far as I know, immediately, sir. You received a reply within three or four minutes, but you only knew from what... Mr. Phillips told me. Just what did he tell you? He told me to go to the captain and report to Frankfurt. What did he say when you handed him this message? He wanted to know where she was. I told him we would get that as soon as we could. What was the next message received by Mr. Phillips? A reply from the Carpathia. What did the Carpathia message say? She sent her latitude and longitude and told him she was coming along as quickly as possible. She turned around and was steaming full speed, or words to that effect. What did the captain say when you delivered that message? He came back with me to the cabin. What took place? Why, he worked out the difference between the Carpathia's position and ours, sir. Did you have any other communication with the Frankfurt after the ship responded to the distress call? Yes, sir. He called up at a considerably long period afterwards and asked us what was the matter. How long after? I should say that it would be considerably over 20 minutes afterwards. To that message, what did you say? I think Mr. Phillips responded rather hurriedly. What did he say? I would like to know. Well, he told him he was a, a fool, sir. After you told him he was a fool, did you tell him the ship was going down? No, sir. We told him to stand by, sir, to keep out of it, not to interfere with the instrument, because we were in communication with the Carpathia, and we knew that the Carpathia was the best thing doing. Did you give him any additional information? No, sir. He ought not to have wanted any in the first place. Mr. Bride. I want this record to be as complete as possible, and I desire to know why, after a message was received from the Frankfurt saying, what is the matter? You did not reply, we are sinking and the lives of our passengers and crew are in danger. You see, it takes a certain amount of time to transmit that information, sir. If the man had understood properly, as he ought to have, CQD would have been sufficient, sir. CQD is the whole thing in a nutshell, you see. I want to know whether the communications between the Titanic and the Carpathia were not also within the radius of the Frankfurt. I would like to know whether these communications could have been picked up by the Frankfurt. Certainly. You ought to have heard every word that passed between us. I would like to know whether it would have taken any longer or any more effort for you to have sent the same message to the Frankfurt that was sent to the Carpathia when you realized you were in imminent danger. Is there any code signal for fool? No, sir. As a matter of fact, it would not have taken any more time to say we are sinking than it would to have told him you are a fool. I assume Mr. Phillips thought that if he did not get our first CQD, which was sent slowly and carefully by Mr. Phillips, he would not get anything else. Do you think he understood your message that he was a fool? I doubt it. Uh, I think it was too fast for him. What did you do then, Mr. Bride? On Mr. Phillips' request, I started to gather up his spare money and put on another overcoat, made general preparations for leaving the ship. You waited until the captain told you that you could leave the ship? Yes, sir. 
How long before the ship disappeared? I should say it was just about a quarter of an hour. Did the bridge go underwater at about the same time? Yes, sir. The whole of the ship was practically underwater to the forward funnel. And when I saw her go down, the stern came out of the water and she slid down fore and aft. The captain in no time went over until the vessel sank. No, sir. He went with the vessel. Practically speaking, yes, sir. The testimony of first-class passenger Mrs. J. Stewart White was taken separately before Senator William Alden Smith, chairman of the Senate subcommittee, on Thursday, May 2nd, 1912. I want to ask you one or two questions, Mrs. White, and let you answer them in your own way. Did you see anything after the accident bearing upon the discipline of the officers or crew or their conduct which you desired to speak of? Yes, lots about them. Tell me about that. For instance, before we cut loose from the ship, two of the seamen with us, the men I should say, I, I do not call them seamen, I think they were dining room stewards. All of those men escaped under the pretense of being oarsmen. The man who rowed me took his oar and, and rowed all over the boat in every direction. And I said to him, well, why don't you put the oar in the oar lock? And he said, do you put it in that hole? I said, certainly. He said, I never had an oar in my hand before. I spoke to the other man and he said, I have never had an oar in my hand before, but I think I can row. Those were the men that we were put to sea with that night. With all those magnificent fellows left on board who, who would have been such a protection to us. I wish you would describe as nearly as you can just what took place after your lifeboat got away from the Titanic. We simply rowed away. We had the order on leaving the ship to, to do that. The officer who put us in the boat, I, I, I do not know who he was, gave strict orders to the seamen or, or the men to, to make for the light opposite and land the passengers and get back just as soon as possible. That was the light that everyone saw in the distance. Did you see it? Yes, I saw it distinctly. What was it? It was a boat of some kind. How far away was it? Oh, it, it was 10 miles away, but we could see it distinctly. There was no doubt that it was a boat. But we rowed and rowed and rowed, and then we all suggested that it was simply impossible for us to get to it, that we never could get to it, and the thing to do was to go back and see what we could do for the others. What was your impression as it went down? It was something dreadful. In my opinion, the ship, when it went down, was broken in two. Will you describe what you saw after daybreak with regard to ice or icebergs? After we got aboard the Carpathia, we could see 13 icebergs and 45 miles of floating ice, distinctly, right around us in every direction. Everybody knew we were in the vicinity of icebergs. It was unusually cold. It was a careless, reckless thing. As I said before, the men in our boat were anything but seamen, with the exception of one man. The women all rowed, every one of them. Where would we have been if it had not been for our women, with such men as that put in charge of the boat? There is another point that has never been brought out in regard to this accident. And that is that the steamer had no open decks except the top deck. How could they fill the lifeboats properly? They could not lower a lifeboat 70 feet with any degree of safety with more than 20 people in it. Where were they going to get any more in them on the way down? There were no other open decks. Just to think that a beautiful starlit night you could see the stars reflected in the water. With all those warnings that they would allow such an accident to happen, with such a terrible loss of life and property. There were no male passengers in your boat? Not one. I never saw a finer body of men in my life than the passengers of this trip. Athletes and men of sense. And if they had been permitted to enter these lifeboats with their families, the boats would have been appropriately manned and, and, and many more lives saved. 
instead of allowing the stewards to get in the boats and, and, and save their lives under the pretense that they could row, when they knew nothing whatever about it. I'm very much obliged to you for your statement, Mrs. White. The testimony of Second Officer Charles Herbert Lightoller was taken before the Senate Subcommittee on Friday, April 19th, 1912. What is your name? Charles Herbert Lightoller. Mr. Lightoller, where do you reside? Netley Abbey, Hampshire. England? England. What position do you occupy now? Second officer of the Titanic. When did you go aboard the Titanic? In Belfast, March 19th or 20th. Did you make the so-called trial trips? Yes, sir. Of what did they consist? Turning circles and adjusting compasses. After the final test, what was done with the boat? We proceeded toward Southampton. Immediately? Almost immediately after taking on board a few things that had been left behind which were required for the completion of the ship. Was the life-saving equipment complete? Yes, sir. Did you know of the wireless message from the America to the Titanic warning you that you were in the vicinity of icebergs? I cannot say that I saw that individual message. Just tell us, if anything, what did you hear about that and from whom, if you can? From the captain. From six until ten o'clock, was the captain on the bridge at all? Yes, sir. When did he arrive? Five minutes to nine. When he came to the bridge at five minutes to nine, what did he say to you, or what did you say to him? We spoke about the weather, calmness of the sea, about the time we should be getting up to the vicinity of the ice and how we should recognize it if we should see it, freshening up our minds as to the indications that ice gives of its proximity. We just conferred together generally for 25 minutes. Tell us as nearly as you can just where you saw the captain last with reference to the sinking of the ship. I think the bridge was the last place I saw him, sir. I'm not sure. I think he was crossing the bridge. No, sir, just coming across the bridge. I merely recognized a glimpse. I, I have a slight recollection of having seen him whilst I was walking. What were the last orders you heard him give? When I asked him, shall I put the women and children in the boats? He replied, yes, and lower away. Those were the last orders he gave. What did you do then? I carried out his orders. Who determined the number of people who should go into the lifeboats? I did. How did you reach a conclusion as to the number that should be permitted to go in? My own judgment about the strength of the tackle. How many did you put in each boat? In the first boat, I put about 20 or 25. How many men? No men. As a matter of fact, it was not much more than half loaded, was it? You mean it's floating capacity? Yes. Floating capacity, no. How did it happen that you did not put more people into that boat? because I did not consider it safe. In a great emergency like that, where there were limited facilities, could you not have afforded to try to put more people into that boat? I did not know it was urgent then. I had no idea it was urgent. Suppose you had known it was urgent, what would you have done? I would have taken more risks. You must have been painfully aware of the fact that there were not enough boats there to care for that large passenger list, were you not? Yes, sir. Now, from what you've said, you discriminated entirely in the interest of the passengers, first the women and children, in filling these lifeboats? Yes, sir. Why did you do that? Because of the captain's orders or because of the rule of the sea? The rule of human nature. There must have been 2,000 people there on that part, the unsubmerged part of the boat. All the engineers and other men and many of the firemen were down below and never came on deck. They never came on deck? 
No, sir. They were never seen. That would reduce it by a great number. What other officers besides yourself survived? The third, fourth, and fifth, sir. I offer to be printed into the record an affidavit made by Daisy Minahan. Daisy Minahan, being first duly sworn upon oath, deposes and says, Oh, I was asleep in stateroom C-78. I was awakened by the crying of a woman in the passageway. I roused my brother and his wife, and we began at once to dress. No one came to give us warning. We spent five minutes in dressing and went on deck to the port side. A frightful slant of the deck toward the bow of the boat gave us our first thought of danger. An officer came and commanded all women to follow, and he led us to the boat deck on the starboard side. He told us there was no danger but to get into a lifeboat as a precaution only. Uh, after making three attempts to get into boats, we succeeded in getting into lifeboat number 14. The crowd surging around the boats was getting unruly. When the lifeboat was filled, there were no seamen to man it. The officer in command of number 14 called for volunteers in the crowd who could row. Six men offered to go. At times, when we were being lowered, we were at an angle of 45 degrees and expected to be thrown into the sea. As we reached the level of each deck, men jumped into the boat until the officer threatened to shoot the next man who jumped. We landed in the sea and rowed to a safe distance from the sinking ship. The officer counted our number and found us to be 48. The Titanic was fast sinking. After she went down, the cries were horrible. This was at 2.20 a.m. by a man's watch who stood next to me. At this time, three other boats and ours kept together by being tied to each other. The cries continued to come over the water. Some of the women implored Officer Lowe of number 14 to divide his passengers among the three other boats and go back to rescue. His first answer to those requests was, you ought to be damn glad you're here and have got your own life. After some time, he was persuaded to do as he was asked. As I came up to him to be transferred to the other boat, he said, jump, God damn you, jump. I had showed no hesitancy and was waiting only my turn. He had been so blasphemous during the two hours we were in his boat that the women at my end of the boat all thought he was under the influence of liquor. Then he took all of the men who had rowed number 14 together with the men from the other boats and went back to the scene of the wreck. We were left with a steward and a stoker to row our boat, which was crowded. The steward did his best, but the stoker refused at first to row, but finally helped two women, who were the only ones pulling on that side. It was just four o'clock when we sighted the Carpathia, and we were three hours getting to her. On the Carpathia, we were treated with kindness and given every possible comfort. Daisy Minahan. The testimony of first-class passenger Mrs. Helen W. Bishop was taken separately before the Senate subcommittee on Tuesday, April 30th, 1912. I wish you would tell the committee what you did after learning of this accident. My husband awakened me at about a quarter of twelve and told me that the boat had struck something. We both dressed and went up on deck. After being there about five or ten minutes, one of the men we were with ran up and spoke to the captain, who was just then coming down the stairs. Who was the man? Mr. Astor. Colonel Astor? Yes. The captain told him something in an undertone. He came back and told six of us, who were standing with his wife, that we had better put on our life belts. About five minutes later, the boats were lowered and we were pushed in. We had no idea that it was time to get off, but the officer took my arm and told me to be very quiet and get in immediately. They put the families in the first two boats. 
My husband was pushed in with me, and we were lowered away with 28 people in the boat. After we had been out in the water about 15 minutes, the Titanic had not yet sunk. Five boats were gathered together, and five people were put into our boat from another one, making 33 people in our boat. We were out there until just before daylight, I think it was, when we saw the lights of the Carpathia and rode as hard as we could and arrived at the Carpathia five or ten minutes after five o'clock in the morning. Is there anything else that you care to say which will throw any light upon our inquiry as to the causes of this catastrophe or the conduct of the officers and crew of the Titanic? The conduct of the crew as far as I could see, was absolutely beyond criticism. It was perfect. The men in our boat were wonderful. One man lost his brother. When the Titanic was going down, I remember he just put his hand over his face, and immediately after she sank, he did the best he could to keep the women feeling cheerful all the rest of the time. We all thought a great deal of that man. Is there anything else you would care to say? No, that is all. Very well, you may be excused. Thank you very much. Ernest Gill, the assistant engineer on the Californian, was called to testify after giving a sworn affidavit to a periodical, the Boston American. Gill's sworn statement would directly contradict Captain Stanley Lord's testimony concerning the position of his ship relative to the Titanic throughout the night of the disaster. What is your name? Ian Gill. I want you to read the following statement and ask you whether it is true. I, the undersigned Ernest Gill, being employed as second document on the steamship the California, Captain Lloyd, give the following statement of the incidents of the night of Sunday, April the 14th. I am 29 years of age, native of Yorkshire, single. I was making my first voyage on the Californian. On the night of April the 14th, I was on duty from 8pm until 12 in the engine room. At 11.56, I came on deck. The stars were shining brightly. It was very clear and I could see for a long distance. The ship's engines had been stopped since 10.30 and she was drifting amid floor ice. I looked over the rail on the starboard side and I saw the lights of a very large steamer about 10 miles away. I could see her broadside lights. I watched her fully for a minute. They couldn't have helped but see her from the bridge in the lookout. I turned in, but I could not sleep. In a half an hour, I turned out thinking to smoke a cigarette. Because of the cargo, I could not smoke between decks, so I went up on deck again. I had been on deck about 10 minutes when I saw a white rocket about 10 miles away on the starboard side. I thought it must be a shooting star. In seven or eight minutes, I saw distinctly a second rocket in the same place, and I said to myself, that must be a vessel in distress. It was not my business to notify the bridge or the lookouts, but they couldn't have helped but see them. I turned in immediately after, supposing that the ship would pay attention to the rockets. I knew no more until I was awakened at 6.40 by the chief engineer, who said, turn out to render assistance, the Titanic has gone down. I went down on wash and heard the second and the fourth engineers in conversation. Mr. J.C. Evans is the second and Mr. Wooden is the fourth. The second was telling the fourth that the third officer had reported rockets gone up on his watch. I knew then that it must have been the Titanic that I had seen. The second engineer added that the captain had been notified by the apprentice officer, whose name I think is Gibson of the rockets. The skipper told him to master the vessel in distress. Then, according to Mr. Evans, Mr. Gibson went to the captain again and reported more rockets. The skipper told him to continue to mast until he got a reply, but no reply was received. The next remark I heard, the second pass, was, why in the devil didn't they wake the wireless man up? The entire crew of the steamer had been talking amongst themselves about the disregard of the rockets. I personally urged several to join me in protesting against the conduct of the captain, but they refused because they feared to lose their jobs. A day or two before the ship reached a port, 
The skipper called the quartermaster, who was on duty at the time. The rockets were discharged into his cabin. They were in conversation for about three quarters of an hour. The quartermaster declared that he did not see the rockets. I am quite sure that the California was less than 20 miles from the Titanic, which the officers report to have been our position. I could not have seen her if she'd been more than 10 miles distant, and I saw her very plainly. I have no ill will towards the captain or any officer on this ship, and I am losing a profitable berth by making this statement. I am actuated by the desire that no captain who refuses or neglects to give aid to a vessel in distress should be able to hush up the men. Ernest Gill. I will ask you, witness, whether this statement is true. Yes, sir, that is correct. You estimate that the rockets went up not 20 miles away from the California? It could not be 20 miles away, sir. I could not see 20 miles away. I seen the ship, and she had not had time to get 20 miles away by the time I got on deck again. You think it may have been the Titanic? Yes, sir. I am of the general opinion that the crew is that she was the Titanic. The committee eagerly looked forward to hearing Captain Stanley Lord give his account of what had happened that night. Captain Lord was unsuccessful in refuting numerous eyewitness accounts that had placed the Californian within a 10 to 12 mile radius of the sinking Titanic. Additionally, Cyril Evans, the Marconi wireless operator on board the Californian, gave damaging testimony regarding Lord's involvement. As a result of this contradictory evidence, Lord's testimony was received by the committee with a great deal of skepticism and doubt. And over time, Captain Lord, like J. Bruce Ismay, would be shunned by public opinion. What is your full name and where do you reside? Stanley Lord, Liverpool, England. What age are you, Captain? 35, sir. Do you know anything regarding the Titanic disaster of your knowledge? Did you see the ship on Sunday? No, sir. Or any signals from her? Not from the Titanic. Was the Titanic beyond your range of vision? I should think so. Nineteen and a half or twenty miles away. If you had received the CQD distress call from the Titanic on Sunday evening after your communication with the Titanic, how long, under the conditions which surrounded you, would it have taken you to have reached the scene of the catastrophe? At the very least, two hours. Two hours? Yeah, at the very least. The way the ice was packed around us, and it being nighttime. It took the Carpathia about four hours to reach the scene of the Titanic's accident after they received word. Hmm, so I understand. Do you know whether your wireless operator was on duty Sunday night after you sent the warning message to the Titanic? I do not think he was. Suppose your wireless operator had been in the operating room when the CQD call of distress came out from the Titanic, which was received by the Carpathia and other ships. Would your ship have been apprised of the distress of the Titanic? Most certainly. On that Sunday night when you were stopped by the ice, were you hemmed in by it, or was your ship floating about? We were just floating about. Could you have gone to the relief of the Titanic at that time? Most certainly. You could have gone? We could have gone, yes. The engines were not running then? The engines were stopped, perfectly stopped. Did you keep lookout men on duty after your engines were stopped? A man on the lookout? Uh, only one, the man in the crow's nest. Captain, did you see any distress signals on Sunday night, either rockets or the more signals? No, sir, I did not. The officer on watch saw some signals, but he said they were not distress signals. But he reported them. I think you'd better let me tell you that story. I wish you would. I came off the bridge at half past ten. I pointed out to the officer that I thought I saw a light coming along. He said he thought it was a star, and I did not say anything more. I went down below. I was talking with the engineer about keeping the steam ready, and we saw these signals coming along, and I said, there's a steamer coming. 
At 20 minutes to one, I whistled up the speaking tube and asked him if she's getting any nearer. He said, no, she's not taking any notice of us. So I said, I, I will go down and lie down a bit. At a quarter past one, he said, I think she's fired a rocket. He said, she did not answer the Morse lamp and she's commenced to go away from us. I said, call her up and let me know what once what her name is. So he went and put the whistle back and apparently uh, he was calling. I could hear him ticking over my head. Then I went to sleep. The rockets that are used are for the same purpose and are understood, are they not, among mariners? As being distress rockets? Yes. Oh, yes. You never mistake a distress rocket. Suppose the Morse signals and the rockets were displayed and exploded on the Titanic continuously for a half to three quarters of an hour after she struck ice. Would you, from the position of your ship on a night like Sunday night, have been able to see those signals? We could not have seen her Morse code. That is an utter impossibility. Could you have seen rockets? I do not think so. Nineteen and a half miles is a long ways. From the log which you hold in your hand and from your knowledge, is there anything you can say further which will assist the committee in its inquiry as to the causes of this catastrophe? No, sir, there is nothing. Only that it was a very deceiving night. That is all I can say about that. Senator Smith closed the hearings on Saturday, the 25th of May, just five weeks after they had started. Three days later, Senator Smith produced the final report. The committee was able to establish that the Titanic had been warned of ice on at least four separate occasions, the last coming from the Californian reporting that he had hove to due to ice. This last warning was received one hour before the Titanic's fatal impact with the iceberg. It was also found that the crew of the Titanic failed to take any of these reports under advisement and displayed a lack of prudence. Indeed, the last radio message had prompted the response, Shut up, I am busy, I am working with Cape Race. The committee found that no general discussion took place among the officers to consider these warnings. The speed was not reduced, the lookout was not increased, and the only vigilance displayed were instructions to the crew to keep a sharp lookout for ice. With respect to the speed of the vessel, the committee determined that it had been increased on each day of the voyage. It was further believed that on the night the collision occurred, the Titanic had been sailing at full speed, 21 knots or 24 and a half miles per hour. It was further concluded that although the Carpathia was the first ship to arrive to rescue survivors, she was not the closest vessel. Based on the total testimony, the committee was forced to the inevitable conclusion that the closest ship was the Californian. The committee determined that she was certainly closer to the Titanic than the 19 miles reported by her captain. Moreover, it was found that the officers and crew had seen distress signals coming from the Titanic, but had failed to respond to them in accordance with the dictates of humanity and the requirement of law. Senator Smith reported that the conduct of the Californian and its captain, whether arising from indifference or gross carelessness, was most reprehensible. Had assistance been promptly offered, or had the wireless operator of the Californian remained a few minutes longer at his position on Sunday evening, the ship might have had the proud distinction of rescuing the passengers and crew of the Titanic. After it had presented its findings, the committee then determined that additional legislation was necessary to secure the safety of lives at sea. Finally, it was decided that no vessel should be licensed to carry passengers from ports in the United States until all regulations had been fully met. Senator Smith offered his own summation of the tragedy to the Senate, and part of it reads as follows. In our imagination, we see again the proud ship instinct with life and energy brave men and noble women of every land. At the very moment of their greatest joy, the ship suddenly reels, mutilating and groaning. With splendid courage, the musicians fill the last moments with sympathetic melody. The ship, 
wearily gives up the unequal battle. Only a vestige remains of the men and women that but a moment before quickened her spacious apartments with human hopes and passions, sorrows and joys. Upon that broken hull, new vows were taken, new fealty expressed, old love renewed, and those who devoted in friendship and companions in life went proudly and defiantly on the last life pilgrimage together. In such a heritage, we must feel ourselves more intimately related to the sea more than ever before. And henceforth, it will send to us on its rising tide the cheering and salutations from those we have lost. I'm David McCallum. <laughs>